Well, hello everyone and welcome back to my sewing room. How is everyone today? Good, I hope. The weather has finally broken here in Ohio. It probably won't stay very long, but it's finally flannel weather for me and I'm so excited. So today I'm gonna talk about some heirloom sewing. Now there's a stigmatism to heirloom sewing. Everyone seems to think that it's just for christening gowns and you know, uh, frilly things. And yes, it is the whole concept of heirloom sewing is a little more on the romantic side, a little more feminine. Um, I remember back in the mid nineties, that's when um, it really started gaining popularity. And I was actually in school for photography and photography just wasn't getting it for me. So I stopped at a Joanne Fabrics and there is an issue of, um, uh, so beautiful magazine and there were there was a garment in there that was one of Martha's vintage garments and then they recreated it and just something struck me with that and I just said I think I'm going into the wrong profession photography just it wasn't it wasn't exciting all through high school I was all about photography I had my camera with me everywhere but then I just saw that one garment and I thought you know, am I doing something wrong with my life? So I looked into fashion design school and I started um, going to fashion design. And that's when I was living in Florida. Then when I moved back um, to Ohio, um, I was going to Kent State for fashion design and I had to choose a minor. And my minor, um, I decided to go uh, try theater, costuming design um, for, for theater. So when, once I got over there and started taking my minor classes, my whole world changed once again. I just loved being in the theater atmosphere. So I started doing more, more of that. So going back to that first um, issue that I ever picked up of uh, So Beautiful magazine, it was a reproduction. They created a reproduction of an Edwardian gown. Um, it was filled with lace and everything. So I started really getting into more of the history of fashion, um, past garments, and learning all of that heirloom sewing has taken me a little bit further with my costuming because I do a lot of late Victorian and Edwardian garments. So let me show you this one. These are some bloomers that I'm working on. These are mid uh, Victorian bloomers. You can see that they are split drawers. And yes, that is how they wore them. Um, so if you can see here, I created um, a fancy band um, to put on the bloomer. So I did have to adjust the size. They're actually called drawers. They're not called bloomers, but most people know them as bloomers. Um, I did have to adjust them so that I can add that fancy band because it does, you know, obviously add length. But again, learning those techniques allowed me to move into this easily. I was, I already had the skill set of making those type of garments. Um, also, let me show you here. This was one of my very first heirloom projects. So, it has some lace shaping on it, um, decorative stitching, satin stitching, and a Madeira border. And I'm gonna show you that a little later as well. So learning this stuff, you know, I'm grateful to have it. And some of the techniques you can use um, outside of the feminine way um, and make it a little more modern. And I have something I will show you um, a little later that is more modern that I did use these techniques and I'll show you show you that as well. Also, I want to give a shout out to our our quilt binder attachment. Which, ugh, sorry, I have it right here, our quilt attachment. I was able to finish off those edges of the split with that. It just went so easy. I know this uh, this uh, YouTube or this Facebook isn't about that particular tool, but I just, you know, look at your tools. They can be used for multiple things. It's just not for quilt binding. I was able to finish my Victorian drawers with that. So let me show you 
um, some of my favorite techniques, um, especially what I used in the drawers. And then um, we'll move over to the Madeira a little bit later, but let me show you some basics. And I'm going to switch cameras here for a second because I wanna show you some things. So we have different types of laces. And I hope you can see them all. So let me put them in order here. So these are French laces. These have um, the ability, we can stitch them together, which I'm gonna show you how I do that. Um, this is an edging and this is an insertion. So they can be used together or alone or they can be used um, with entredo in between, but it's rare that I ever use entredo in, in between. That's a personal preference. Um, you don't have to, these easily um, stitch together all on their own. And then these are called Swiss embroideries. And what they basically are is embroideries that are on um, a fine Batiste fabric. This one is considered an insertion and a beading, and it's a beading because of all these holes. You can run um, ribbon through them, as I did here on uh, my drawers. Now, this is a cotton crochet type of uh, lace that I used, and then put my uh, ribbon through that. And this is an edging, and this one has entredeau onto it already, and this is just an insertion. So let's go ahead, head over to my machine, and let's get that set up. And I'm going to show you some basic um, sewing. The first one I'm going to show you is I'm going to sew lace to lace. And all you need is a simple zigzag. Now, um, I'm sewing on the Epic 2 today. And we have the ability to save stitches into that, into our machine. So I already went ahead and I did do that. So if I bring up my save stitches from my folder, I actually named my, um, my stitches and this one is called Lace to Lace. So I already did all of the math for it, but a good jumping off point um, for, I'm using, first of all, the center zigzag and I'm using a 2.5 stitch length and a 2.5 stitch width. So um, that, that is going to take a little bit of time to, to figure out on your machine. It might be different. Your laces might be different. But once you find that sweet spot, go ahead and save it to your machine and it makes life a lot easier. So today, if you remember from my stabilizers, I am using um, stitch in ditch. That is a stabilizer. So um, if one of my team members, Meredith or Amy, if you can type that in so that they know the spelling of that, um, it is a paper-like stabilizer. So the, the consistency of it is the weight is between, let me bring you back to my face here quick. The stitch in the ditch, the weight is in between a tissue paper and a photocopy paper, um, but it tears away easily. And I am going to use it here as a leader just to help me get started. I'm also going to change my foot. There's two different feet that you can use. Now with the zigzag stitch, it says to use um, the recommended foot is a B foot, but I, just because it says it should be the B foot doesn't mean you have to use the B foot. I am going to use um, the edge joining foot. So there's two of them. This is one of them. And if you look at it, it has like a flange right in the center of it. And there's also the clear one. So that's what that looks like. I prefer the clear one myself. So let's come over here. And everyone has their own preferences. And I do have a camera that's sitting like right next to my cheek. So I may look a little clumsy here. To get started, again, I'm in, 
I'm in my little leader here and I am going to use my uh, needle down to help me get started. Now that flange right there, you want your laces and this is called um, an edging or the leader of it. You want that to sit on either side of that little flange. And you should not have to do a whole lot of work. Once you have your zigzag the way you want it, it should um, it should work out for you. And what that flange is doing is helping it from not overlapping, but just keep it right next to each other. I'm using blue thread here so you can see it. And this is also a 60 weight thread. Most of the time, because these are our delicate uh, fabrics or trims, I do use um, a 60 weight. Um, sometimes I'll use a 50 weight and if necessary, I'll, I'll use the, the 40 weight because if that's what I have. Okay. So there you have it. So it's, it's nicely, oops, it's nicely stitched. Um, if you were using white thread, it should just disappear. And when you give this a nice little press, um, it'll, it'll flatten out. You may also want to do some spray starch on that before you start stitching it together to help control those puckers. But most of the time, I don't do that a whole lot. Um, I usually just press that out. Okay, so the next one I'm going to do is something a little bit simpler. I'm going to show you my entredo, how I do entredo. To, so this is my lace insertion and this is my entredo. There's two steps to this. And I am going to put on my A foot. I'm gonna put that back on for now. And we put them together. So the first step is you wanna stitch right next to the entredeau and I need to switch stitches. I am just going to use my um, A2, which is a straight center stitch. And I wanna stitch right next to that. And it wants to do the integrated dual feed. get a little closer. Okay, not so good there, but good down here. So you wanna just stitch right next to, uh, to the holes there and you'll trim it away. I'm gonna trim right next to my stitching there. This is going to create a very narrow seam allowance. And we're going to do what we like to call a roll and whip for the next step. And again, once you figure out, once you do a small test, and figure out the swing, the left and right swing of your um, zigzag stitch, which we're going to go back and do. I am going to, I have mine saved and I actually have mine saved. It's called, I called it um, entredo stitch. Just something, you know, because I know, okay, that's my stitch that I use for when I'm sewing entredo. So it's going to swing left and right. Now this is going to be a personal preference. If you see here, you have little holes there. Some will stitch into the hole and some will stitch just out of the hole. I go back to my face for a moment. With these holes, it depends on what thread you're using and it's also personal preference. If you're using a heavier weight thread, what will happen is if you stitch into the holes, sometimes the thread fills those holes. So when you open it up, you don't have those defined, defined holes. 
Me personally, I prefer to stitch just outside those holes. So I leave my seam allowance just a tad slightly bigger, knowing that that's what I'm going to do. Because there's times that I am just not in my right mind when I'm sewing. I could be thinking of other things and I'm just sewing along and I don't necessarily pay attention to those holes. Sometimes I'll miss them. Sometimes I go far too far into them. So I've trained myself when I'm doing this process to just stitch, to do that zigzag, that roll and whip just next to those holes. Again, personal preference, um, whichever you want to do, completely up to you. So I'm going to go back here. I brought up my, just get that thread out of there. I brought up my entredeau stitch, and again, it is a zigzag, and I am going to use a leader. Do you see how we can just keep using this piece over and over? That's why I love this stuff. And I'm going to bring it down just so that I can see where I'm at. Integrate it dual. I have my um, knot turned on, and I should have turned that off because I'm not a big fan of that when we're doing such intricate sewing. But if you can see what's happening here is the swing of the needle is going off the edge, and what it's doing is it's rolling it over onto itself. Kind of like what a rolled edge would do on a serger, but this is, um, you know, on a sewing machine. And you see how I'm just staying right next to the holes? I'm not going into it. Now, if you wanted to go into the holes, you would need to adjust your swing, um, your left and right swings, so that it will jump over further. And that's completely up to you. I prefer not to. up on me a little that's okay so you can see here I went off a little bit that's okay you can just go back and fix that not a big deal and if it was um, of course it would look nicer if it was white thread but when you open it up do you see how that how those holes are very defined Whereas if I were doing a thicker thread and I went into the holes, it would, it would fill those holes and it wouldn't look as, it wouldn't look as nice as this does. And the whole purpose of uh, Entredeau is to give a reprieve um, for those um, laces in between. And Entredeau, I believe in French is in between. Okay, so do we have any questions on that? Let me see. Yes, that is how you spell entredeau. <laughs> it's, it is French. Some pronounce it entredeau. Some pr pronounce it entre entredeau. It's, you know, I'm not French, so I don't know the exact pronunciation. I always known it as entredeau. Uh, you want to cut the fabric before the roll and whip because you need to narrow that seam allowance. If you noticed... Let me show you my entredeau. Here's the entredeau. Do you see how wide that is? You don't want it that wide. Um, when you're sewing um, this style of sewing, it's very delicate. It's um, it's all about having small seams. It's, it's all about things molding together to look like it was already one. And if you don't trim that away after you sew it, that's going to be a very wide swing to get it to roll over. And if you do, it's going to be quite bulky. So that is why we are trimming it. Okay, any questions? Nope. Oh, sorry. So let me give you some inspiration here. So I created this. It was inspired by um, the show Victoria on PBS, I don't know if anybody saw that. Um, I totally loved it and um, I watched it like three times. Um, I'll watch it again 
because it is one of my favorite. I do find lots of shows that have historical historical garments in it because I do recreate historical garments. I do have a background in custom design, so I still like to like to do it and I still like to make costumes. I'm not a cosplayer per se, um, but I do, I still work in theater as well. I work at my local uh, theater here and we do some cost, we do some uh, period costume pieces. So I'm glad that I get to stay with it. So here on this part right here, what I did was I created my own lace and how I did that was I just cut some pieces of, um, I know I had it here somewhere. Oh, here. This is called bobinette or cotton netting. I didn't have a real small piece to, and I didn't want to cut a piece off of this because this is not cheap stuff. So do you see that? It looks like tulle, um, but it is 100% cotton. It, it It is a little bit expensive and it does, it is, a little scratchy and it is a little stiff. And what I did was I went into my sewing machine and just found some decorative stitches and stitched it out in a heavier white thread. I believe I used um, just a regular 40 weight sewing thread to stitch this out. And I backed it with a water soluble stabilizer. I didn't want to use um, stitch and ditch for that one um, because these stitches are, a, they're on the heavier side. I wanted a little bit more support. So I did cut strips of um, Aqua Magic and put that behind the cotton netting and did my uh, decorative stitches on it. And there are just a plethora of decorative stitches that you can choose from on this machine. and. Notice that I didn't use a single piece of lace in this. All of this is either tux, created my own lace. This was a little embroidery design that I created and stitched out um, with the embroidery unit. And down at the bottom, this is just some of the scallop stitches that are also built into the machine. Um, again, I used a, a water soluble, soluble stabilizer behind that. I did my stitching across it, and then I did some really fine trimming on that to get really close to those scallops. And then I washed it away. I did leave the water soluble stabilizer on it as I was trimming it. It helped give it a little bit support while I was cutting, and it just helped with um, whatever little pieces were left. It did help uh, glue that in place. So. If you want that super soft, this one, this particular little dress can be washed again because to me it's a little stiff and I can feel I did not get all of the water stabilizer out. So I probably eventually someday will um, wash that again just to get more of that out. Let me see. Thank you, whoever said my lace is beautiful. Is the roll and whip a, a zigzag? Yes, the, the roll and whip is a zigzag. So I did change the dimensions on it. So I used again, the center zigzag on the Epic 2 and some of the other machines. You have a left position, you have a right position, you have a center position zigzag. I almost always go for that center position um, because that's what I'm used to. I, on other machines, when I started doing heirloom sewing, I didn't have the three options. I only had the one center. So I trained myself to use that center position. So that's the one I go to. Um, if you go and choose the, um, the right or the left position, again, you want to take some scraps of your laces and just um, do a test and watch the swing of how it goes. You will need to adjust the length and the width on both. It's, um, I've never had it just use the default. I've always had to make some kind of adjustment. You want it um, nice and dainty, but you don't want it to look like a satin stitch, if, if that helps. Okay, so let me go into this. This is the collar, if you can see the collar. I don't know if you can see it. Again, it is cotton netting. 
And for this, I basically did the same thing as the lace, um, the insertion lace. I drew out the shape of the whole entire collar on a piece of cotton netting. So I did not cut it out. I just drew it on and then put some water soluble stabilizer behind it. Again, I used Aqua Magic. That is the, the fibrous one, not the uh, cellophane looking uh, water soluble. And I did my scallop stitching and, and then I did my decorative stitching right next to it. After I had all the stitching done, then I cut out the whole entire collar. Um, it makes life so much easier. And if it's easier to fix mistakes if you mess up when it's as a whole piece. Okay. Let's see, what do I have next? Um, what foot did you use to add the entredeau? I just used um, the A foot. Uh, but if you're more comfortable, you could also use uh, an open toe foot so that you can see a little bit clearly. I tend to use an open toe foot for um, quite a bit of things. It just depends on what the application is, but I just used um, the A foot. You could use the B foot as well. There is also, uh, which let me see if I have it right here, one of my best friends, and I seem to use this foot the most. This isn't it. This is my mini piping foot. Yes, I use that. But there is a, a blue, a, a clear blue, a clear B foot. So that has become my friend. I don't have it right next to me, but I do seem to use that foot a lot. I really like the clear foot. Okay. So what do I have next? Well, let's talk about the uh, the Madeira applique. So this is Madeira applique, and it's traditionally done by hand. That's, of course, all sewing started by hand. But to get some uh, definite holes, it was done by hand, and it was... And I don't know how to do that pin stitch by hand. I, I never learned and I probably never will. I will be honest with you. And in my historical costuming groups, you know, there are people who just totally love sewing by hand. But my theory is if they had machines like we had back then, they would not be doing it by hand. So there's no reason why I need to do it by hand. There are purists who want to learn how to do those techniques and um, put them in the repertoire. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. I don't, I don't see handwork as a four letter, a bad four letter word like some people do. I just don't, I just don't prefer it. I, I, I've mentioned this before. I'm an instant gratification kind of gal when I'm sewing. So I want to find the fastest, um, the fastest way possible to get a project done because in my head, I have other projects to do. And sometimes I'm working on multiple. Sometimes I'm working on personal uh, personal projects for myself that I have a deadline for, like maybe Halloween. And I also have projects for work that I need to do. And then I also have my theater projects that I work on. So I'm juggling a bunch of things and having this technology is to me is a godsend. But if you wanna do handwork, I fully encourage that. There's nothing wrong with it. And, uh, you know, God bless those who do handwork. Uh, the name of the netting that I use, you can either find it. It is called either bobbin net, spelled um, just like it sounds, bobbin net, or cotton netting. Um, and I, it is... It is not in any local quilt store. You can find it in uh, some shops um, that are in the South. And when I say the South, I mean the Southern states that are below Ohio. I was in Montana two weeks ago doing an event and um, the shop owner had mentioned the South and my mind instantly went to Tennessee, Alabama, Mississippi, because to me, that's the South. But no, she was talking about Southern states on the West Coast um, when she was referring to the South. So when I say South, there is uh, farmhouse fabrics. They probably carry it. Um, 
Smockingbird in Alabama, they may carry it. So heirloom sewing is still very big in what I consider the southern states, Tennessee, Mississippi, Alabama, um, some in Kentucky in that really warm weather. Um, it's fun to travel to all of these different regions of the United States to see what is still, I shouldn't say still popular, what is popular, what is the draw of sewing within those regions. And when I was living in Alabama, which was just a couple years ago, they had, I think, two quilt shops, but five different um, heirloom shops. So to me, it told me that Alabama is still very big into heirloom, which is pretty cool. Um, I don't do a whole lot of it for casual wear or and my girls are, are older, so they're in college. I don't make them that kind of stuff anymore, but I did when they were younger every Easter, I would make them a dress um, either with smocking or some kind of lace work or something on it. Um, but I don't do it anymore. But I, like I said, I do use it for my historical uh, garment sewing. But it's good, you know, every region is slightly different. Some regions may be really big into uh, machine embroidery, um, quilting in the hoop. Others may be just really big into just quilting all together. So each region is different, but it's always good to have those different type of skill sets because you never know when you might decide to use them. Okay, so let's move on to, I showed you this one. Okay, so that's Madeira applique. So I also used it for this pillow. Same technique, two totally different looks. And this is why I'm happy that I have um, these skills in um, my repertoire. So this, this particular one, was done with um, traditional pin stitching from the machine. And I'm gonna show you some of that. And this one was done with just a blanket stitch. Um, but the process to get that border is the same. This one was straight and this one is um, a, a frame, if you will. And this beautiful design, wonderfully textured design, this is on uh, my sew net and it is a ribbon embroidery. So if you have the Sapphire 90, the Epic 1, the Epic 2, um, and if I'm missing a machine, this is for the ribbon attachment. And I think right now this is the only design that has a multiple ribbon option. So I didn't stop the machine. The machine stopped so that I can change the ribbon for all of those. And I found this fabric and I just thought, oh, how perfect. Okay. So let me show you this. And I find myself, <laughs> this is probably the, uh, the technique I use a lot because I love the look of um, that, that frame. So let me get my things here and I'll walk you through how I did that. And I'm gonna switch, switch over here. Okay. So the first thing you wanna do is you want to find a shape that you like. I'm going to do a, a small sample for you, but you can make this as, as big or as small as you like. That pillow that I did, I believe is a 16 by 16. Um, you could do this on, uh, you can make it a rectangle. It can be an oval. It, it, I mean, it's just, you, the shapes are, are endless. You have your, your options. This one I actually found and I printed it off. Um, I have a, oh, what is that called? An art program, like Adobe. I can't think of the word but I have a program that's like Adobe and I was able to create this. Um, this was actually um, a label and I just um, changed it to the size that I want. So I, I got that. And then here I have some freezer paper. I love having freezer paper in my sewing room, gals and guys. I've never, 
I've never used freezer paper for its intended purpose, which is wrapping your meat before you put it in the freezer. I've always used it in my sewing room. It has multiple uses in your sewing room. What I did was I'm going to do an eight, an eight by eight square. So let's say the pillow is going to be eight by eight or my quilt block. You can use this for quilt blocks too. So that's going to be eight by eight. So I needed to think about, so I made this my freezer paper, eight by eight. I have my design here and I found the center of it. And it's very faint, it's in red. I took my freezer paper and I laid it right on top and you can see how I folded it so that I could find my center. And I just laid it on top, making sure that it's centered. And I only traced out one side of it because that's really all you need is just the one side. When I fold it in half, I didn't grab scissors. Sorry about that. When I fold it in half, I will cut directly on that line. Okay, and I'll do it all the way around. And what you end up with is this template. And because it is freezer paper, we are able to just fuse this onto our fabric. Now to get the frame, we need to fold this in half. I did starch this. I think I starched it twice. I want it a little bit stiffer, but I don't want it too stiff. So um, any starch that you have, um, if you use something like the best press that you purchase from your quilt shop, you will need to do it a few times um, to get a little bit stiffer. You can also just use the um, spray starch that you find at the grocery store. Either one is fine, but um, I would steer away from Terial Magic because that can get a little too stiff. Okay, so then we take our freezer paper. Here's my fold. Here's my template. And I have a hot, hot iron here. And if you just, you can just fuse this. To your fabric and it stays. Um, make sure the shiny side is down. Now let's pop over to the machine. I will go back to my straight stitch. And again, that's my utility stitch number two. And what you want to do, oh, before we do that, before we do that, one little thing, we got to take out this bobbin because we are going to use, I'll go back to my face for a second here. We are going to use a, um, a water soluble thread. So this is, it looks like regular white thread. And I use it in my bobbin. And uh, I would highly suggest that you keep this in a plastic baggie and always put it away right away um, because it does, like I said, look like just your standard white thread. So when my daughter was younger, I made her a pair of shorts, little Peter Rabbit, and the base of it was white. And I'm sure you ladies see where this is going. Um, so I was sewing and I had an issue with my bobbin. So what I did was I took that bobbin out and I reached into my little bobbin box and I grabbed out another white bobbin and I popped that in the machine and sewed it off. We're good to go. Um, you know, finished the shorts and everything. And I, I went to wash them. I almost always wash most of my garments after I finished sewing them, threw it in the wash, went through the dryer. And when it came out, they were in two pieces. I had a right leg and a left leg. Why? Because I just grabbed, you know, uh, that bobbin. So I do suggest that you, you know, keep them separated. 
um, and put it in a plastic baggie just to keep it safe. You don't need to put it in the refrigerator. Some people say put it in the refrigerator. It keeps it fresh. I've never done that. Um, I've had this particular thread for, I want to say, maybe five, six years. It's not a thread that I use a lot, so it does last a good long time. Again, check with your quilt shops. They probably have it. I've never seen something like that in, um, in your big box stores, so check with your quilt shop, and we always love supporting our quilt shops. So, okay. Oh, I told this story to a coworker about my shorts splitting apart, you know, because I didn't pay attention to the bobbin. And she said to me, and I will never forget this. She said to me, well, now you know what to do when you have an enemy, just make them a swimsuit. So chuckle that. Let me go over to the machine. In. There's no need to have it in the top and the bottom, just um, in the bobbin should uh, be more than enough. So you have two choices here. You can either trace this on and uh, pull the template away and stitch directly on the line, or you can just sew right next to it. Now I have a camera in my Face, so I am probably not going to do a bang up job of this, but you will get the gist. And that needle down position is our friend, as you can see. If this is the first the first time that you're going to do this, I would suggest not to do something that has a lot of sharp corners. Stick with scallops, um, stick with um, my, my corners are not super sharp. Um, can you do it with super sharp? Yes, you can. It just takes a little more practice and a little more time, but it is possible. Don't shy away from it. Just, you know, try doing some simple curves your first time out. I'm not gonna, I, no need to back tap there. Okay, so once you have, have it stitched out, we will grab our scissors again. And I'm going to stitch, or excuse me, cut about a quarter of an inch away. So we stitched right next to it or we stitched in the line, however we did it. When you have a point like this, let me see if I can show it to you. You're not gonna clip it off like you normally do. So about a quarter of an inch. Do, do, do. For time's sake, I'm not going to. To be too precise about this. Okay, so you have a pretty little scrap here. That's a nice little scrap. You can use this for something, I'm sure. I know we don't throw our scraps away. I don't. This is this could be used for something. It could be a yin and yang quilt block, if you will. Okay. And we'll take our freezer paper away. Now, since this, this is the shiny side, if you're making multiples of these, so if you're making like a quilt block, this can be used again. You can keep using this until it doesn't stick anymore. But if you notice... I have the counterpart because we cut it in half um, from when we cut it out of the, the big piece. So I still have this piece. So if this one um, stops sticking for me, I now have that one. So it basically makes two templates. Okay. So what we need to do is, oops, see that? I missed that point. That's okay. You'll get it. We are going to turn this out. If you have some curves, you may need to clip those curves. Um, just in the seam allowance, you know not to stitch through the stitches. I'm not gonna do too much here so that we can move on. And we turn this out. 
if you have a point turner to get that corner, wonderful. Um, I know we're not supposed to use our scissors, but that's what's right next to me. And we all say we're not supposed to use our scissors, but we all do. Let's not lie. And I think you can see where we're going here. Okay. So once you have it turned out, it's nice and flat. You may need to go back in, clip some more corners. We're going to give that a really good press. We want this crisp. Make sure it's all even. And and what we do is we take our spray starch. This is the fun part. And yep, I'm spraying it pretty darn good. And if you have another piece of fabric or um, a pressing cloth or something like that, you can use that and we will press it dry. Some of you may already know this technique, but it is one of my favorites. I, I really like doing this. And again, I love taking new technology, if you will, and turning it into something. Okay. It's not completely dry, but do you see what happened here? Because we used that wash away thread, it turned in all of my edges. So Madeira applique is basically a type of, uh, for this process, it's a kind of like a reverse applique, but it's turning our edges in. And if we just take this and put it on top of our backing fabric, it's not perfect. I can see that it's not perfect, but it's okay. And then I'll press that again. And just, oops. And then we could just pin this or you can uh, glue it into, into place with a fabric glue pen or um, Roxanne's basting glue. I'm not a big fan of uh, Roxanne's basting glue because it, it is wet opposed to a glue stick that it pretty much dries um, pretty quickly. So there you have it. There's the Madeira applique, but there are some stitches that we can do. And I stitched out a few of them and I'm going to show them up to the light in a moment. So I'm going to put that out of the way. So I have two samples here. I don't know if I could get any closer done with two different threads. This one was done with a 50 weight thread and this one was done with a 60 weight thread. So I'm gonna take this over to my sewing machine so I could put this up to the light. So do you see these have holes in it and it's meant to have holes because we used the wing needle and this is um, basically for pin stitch. So this is in our C category, the heirloom sewing. And there's a few different ones. And if you go into that category, it does suggest to use a wing needle. If you do not have a wing needle, you could use a 100 top stitch needle. No, excuse me, a 110 top stitch needle or a 120 top stitch needle. Although you're not going to get as um, big of a hole as you would with a wing needle. So this one is done with a 40 weight thread. And if I bring this one in, do you see the holes a little bit easier? This one was done with a 60 weight thread. So with the thicker thread, you see that it's filling in the holes that the wing needle made. So again, personal preference, it also depends on what you have, what you have available in your sewing room at the time. I will be honest, this 60 weight thread is um, an embroidery thread. It is a rayon type. Uh, mainly used for um, embroidering out very small lettering. 
Um, but that's what I had and it's working. I can still do what I need to do with it. So let's take out, let's take out our regular needle and let's pop in our, our wing needle. And this is what a wing needle looks like. Can you see that? It actually has wings. And what it does is when it pierces inside into the fabric, it opens those fibers up and then the stitching of that stitch holds that hole open to create that open work. You, it works best on natural fabrics, cotton, linen, silks. Um, I don't know if I've ever done it on a rayon, to be honest with you. Okay, downfall of a wing needle is we cannot use our automatic needle threader. We do have to do it manually. Okay, so switch my camera over back to my table. When we're stitching this down, we have a few options. When we choose the stitch, it's going to suggest that we use the B foot. But as you know, just because it says the B foot doesn't mean you have to use the B foot. I am more partial to the open toe foot. Anytime I do applique, it's always with the open toe foot. But with the Epic 2 and the Epic 1, and I believe the 95Q, um, those have what's called IDF, and that's integrated dual feed built in. So they also have an open toe foot, which is, wow, look at that, much different. It has this little cutout in it so that you can stitch using the IDF. Where this one, if this is from, I had this, well, I've been using Vikings for many years. I had this for a very long time and the feet move up with the machine, which is super nice so that when you know you get a new machine, the feet go with it but it doesn't have for the I, IDF if you, so this will still work on this machine. You just have to make sure that you do not have that IDF integrated into it. Okay, slide this off, slide that on. And let's go ahead and choose our stitch. I'm gonna switch over to the C and let me see, let me pick a stitch. Let's do C8. It's a little different than your, um, the blanket stitch, so it just will look a little different. So right here you have a little red mark. You know, it's hard to see here, but a little red mark right there. That tells you that is the center needle position and that is where I can line my fabric up. When you're doing um, something like this, you want to make sure that you're not doing it starting in a corner or starting in a, a definite curve. Try and find some straight area that you can start stitching in. And do you see how it makes that hole? I hope you can see that. Let me. Do you see that definite hole that's right here? And that's what you want it to do. You want that. And when we're using the thinner thread, the thread isn't going to fill the hole. So it's going to give it a really nice, decorative finish to it. If you find that you have too much give with the fabric, while you're sewing, you can always put a piece of stitch and ditch underneath your fabric to help with that give. And you know what, I'll just tear a piece off of my sample here. Sometimes I sew a little too fast for my own good. I'm not really staying in there, but I sew like I drive. Okay, so I'm gonna just 
just finish off this motif. So there you can see those holes. I'm holding it up to the light so you can see those holes. Not perfect, but if I were at home, uh, well, I am at home. If I were alone in the sewing room, but I'm not, um, I would, uh, of course, pay more attention. But do you see how we have those nice, nice holes? And it is an heirloom stitch. It does say heirloom stitches on that category, but that doesn't necessarily mean you have to use them just for heirloom sewing. As you can see, they are used for other things um, than just heirloom stitching. So I'm gonna stop for a second and see if there's any questions. So um, someone asked um, the name of the netting. I'll say it again. It's either bobbinette or um, cotton netting. Can you make the items in embroidery? Of course. You know, with your Epic 1, your Epic 2, and um, uh, past machines, you have the option to take your sewing stitches into embroidery mode. So yes, you can do it that way. If you wanted to make the lace, uh, I would suggest getting out a um, an endless hoop because it'll be easier to just to do the continuing. So absolutely, anything that I sewed out today, it is possible that you could take take those stitches and take them into um, your embroidery mode. Um, sewing the lace to lace or the lace to entredo, no, I wouldn't necessarily do those in the hoop. I would, you know, do them straight. Um, I don't know how you necessarily would do them in the hoop unless they were digitized to do that. And, um, you know, it's food for thought, something we could look into. I know I have seen some lace shaping designs. So this heart is, um, is one of the French cotton laces and it was shaped, um, that was shaped manually by me by pinning it and, um, pulling the, the leader, but I have seen embroidery designs that has um, that look in the hoop using like the cotton netting or, or any kind of netting or even organza or something like that. So it, I have seen that. I've also seen it as freestanding lace shaping. Um, and again, that's something that you can, I'm, I know there's designs out there that you can find that will do that. So yes, you could do that portion in the hoop. Um, the stitches that I'm using that I used for um, the, the lace to lace and the entredo to lace, those were just a basic zigzag that I needed to adjust. The, the width and the length. As for the um, these stitches, these were all stitches taking, taken from the heirloom menu of the sewing machine using a wing needle. Or again, you can use a 110 top stitch needle or a 120 top stitch needle. But I, if you really want those definite holes there, I would go for the wing needle. I don't know if the big box stores carry the larger wing needles anymore. I've noticed that they've cut back quite a bit on what needles they carry, but I'm sure that your local quilt shop probably has those. Um, heirloom stitches. Um, heirloom stitches name or number, please. Okay, so the heirloom stitches that I use, again, that's in um, menu C. I didn't change for these. I did not adjust them at all. I just left them as they were their default for my, let me go back to my machine and I can tell you exactly what my settings are. For my entredo to, for my lace to lace, I used the center positions zigzag and I adjusted it to a 1.0 width, meaning that's the swing right to left and I changed my length to a 2.0. Those are just jumping off points. You may need to adjust those according to what laces you are sewing together and how uh, and what your entredo is. That's, you know, 
I do strongly suggest take a small piece. It doesn't have to be anything real big, just so that you can make um, sample it out and make those adjustments and then save it to the machine. Many of um, the Viking machines have the options to save your stitches directly to the machine. So you don't have to do that practice or that rehearsal every single time you go to do a technique. Just save, just save those stitches. Saving stitches on a machine goes whew, far back um, and is on almost, I don't wanna say almost all the machines. It's, it, it's on a lot of the machines to have that option. As for my entredeau to lace, I used, again, the center position zigzag and my stitch width and length were 2.5. Um, you may want to make that a little bit closer so you can adjust the stitch length to make those stitches a little bit closer to each other. Um, again, completely up to you. Pull out some lace, pull out some uh, thread that matches your lace and get and just give it a try and, and look at it and say, is that is that the look I want? And then once you find it, save it to your machine. The other thing is um, the French laces, because they are 100% cotton, and I don't know if you can see this too well, um, I was able to dye this pink. So you also have the option that you can also dye these as well. When it comes to, to the Swiss embroideries, depending on the quality of the Swiss embroideries, you may, if you dye them, the, the thread that they used to stitch out the motif may be different than the fabric content itself. So these, if they have any polyester in it, they will probably come out to a different color. So I would just, again, do a little sample of that and give it a try, but you can, you know, if you dye fabric, you have, you, the world opens up to so much more. So I think we're, we're done today. I'm glad you came in to my sewing room and you shared some of my favorite, most used heirloom techniques. And you can see that it's not just for infant clothes um, or christening gowns, it can be used for more. Just to think outside the box of how you can use these techniques. And um, yeah, it just opens up a whole world for you. Just once you start getting in there and just saying, hmm, will this work? Can I try this? Experimenting is always something that happens in my sewing room. Does it always work? Nope, doesn't always work. But you know what? I did, I did try it. And that's all I can say. And sometimes you'll find something that works. Share it with other people. I've said this many times before, this is a, a community of, of sewers and we like sharing with each other. So, you know, go out, try something and, you know, share it with the rest of the world. Let us know how it worked out for you. So next, next Facebook Live is going to be September 21st um, at 2 p.m. Central Time with Kathy Brom, where she'll, she'll explore creative embroidery techniques with your machine. So that's a lot. That'll be fun. Maybe she'll show some heirlooms in the hoop. I don't know. So I want to thank you all again for spending this hour with me. I hope you learned something or you had a refresher. Um, either way, I hope it was good for you. It was fun for me to be here and share um, some of my experiences with you. And I hope to see you all again soon. Talk to you later.